Ever since I was a kid, I was interested in stop motion. The first video I ever posted on YouTube was a stop mo animation back in 2009. It's bad, don't watch it. I grew up on the 50s B-movies animated by Ray Harryhausen, King Kong animated by Willis O'Brien, and Phil Tippett's work on Jurassic Park before they went all CGI. What is stop motion animation? It's a process by which a model or puppet is photographed, moved a little, then photographed again and again and again and again and again, giving the illusion of smooth movement. Corwin has had a long storied history with stop motion. Will Venton Studio, known for the California Raisins and the PJs, operated here from 1975 to 2005. Other studios like Leica, known for Coraline, are still in operation. While stop motion animation is definitely an art, many technical skills are required to make the films come to life. By using 20th century techniques and updating them with 21st century tech, stop motion animation is being brought to the future. We are here at Shadow Machine, the stop motion studio best known for their Academy Award winning work on Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio to talk to their professionals about how stop motion animation just isn't an art but it's also a science. An armature, or a stop motion puppet, are all hand built and engineered to move and stop in the exact place an animator wants them to. They're really good at popping and locking. Meet Alex, the person responsible for putting these armatures together. I'm Alex Andrade, I'm an armaturist at Shadow Machine. It's the skeletal hardware of the puppet. <clears throat> um, primarily, like I said before, is made with ball and socket joints, rods, and then you solder it all together and so you could articulate the puppet thereafter. It hasn't changed much since uh, King Kong 1933, but just the materials have changed. The metal itself is pretty much the same, but it's just been refined over the years. It's O1 tool steel. And uh, there you are people trying to push the envelope and they're trying to use different alloys, composites, um, um, aluminum with bronze for example. So it's, um, the technology is advancing. We would take a illustration or printout of the creature or animal, um, the actual size, and then we would start laying out the joints in the particular regions where they need movement, and we would go from there. Yeah, this puppet's pretty unique in a sense of um, armatures the body and a lot of it's 3D printed. Um, some of the parts are 3D printed using stainless steel. Other is uh, more um, practical using resin. Uh, the front plate of the body is resin, so it's plastic. And then the back piece is stainless steel. Also, the internal parts of the puppet are stainless steel also. And then we set that in a mold to cast resin over it. And then we go ahead and um, give it to the puppet painters where they paint the awesome texture of wood. The head itself is also 3D printed. Um, these are all fabricated here um, using steel and soldering. We connect the pieces together using magnets. Slip this on here. There's also a magnet on the eyes. The nose is also 3D printed in resin. So it's pretty unique in that sense. The uh, there was 3,000 faces printed for the movie for Pinocchio. So it's quite a lot. Stop motion requires a lot of chemistry. Matzilla uses different compounds in order to create the skin of the beloved characters. Some compounds yield harder skin and some yield softer. My name is Matt Zilla Duran and I am a puppet fabricator that specializes in mold making and casting here at Shadow Machine. Here at Shadow Machine, we have two main specific types of molds. We have soft molds and hard molds. The soft molds are usually made with um, multiple types of silicones and the hard molds are oftentimes made with multiple types of urethanes. You want a soft mold if your final product is going to be a hard object such as resin or stone. The soft mold will yield a hard product. Um, the hard molds will yield a soft product. So depending upon what the final needs of said object is purely dependent upon its presentation, performance, and need. When we have a 
a head skin, oftentimes around the cheeks, the mouth, you have a lot more of an expressive puppet that will be performing different. So you will have, whoops, a broken puppet. <laughs> no, you'll have uh, different types of silicones for different types of performances. Oftentimes we'll use a platinum silicone because it is more versatile and a lot more durable on set. And platinum silicones are very fun and unique because they're also food grade. So they're, there's a lot more variety to them that lasts a lot longer versus the other brand. You've got a type called a tin, and tin is great, has a lot of versatility as well, but just for the, our needs here at Shadow Machine, we find that platinum is a lot more durable for long shoots, and you get a lot more performance because of the varieties that it offers. You can add deadeners, thinners, elastomers to a silicone base to basically give it, you know, a stiff performance, or you can stretch it super far and just be very exaggerated with with your puppet. And it's really very exciting to be able to experiment with all that and do research and development in the in the pre-production phases to decide how far can we take this silicone and where is our breaking part where we say, okay, can't do that anymore. So it's there's an awful lot of chemistry and it's mostly percentage based by weight. The main differences between platinum and tin silicones are that platinum silicones cure with a tighter molecular bond so that there is less microscopic surface area for bacteria to grow. That's why a lot of silicone baking mats and ice cube trays, they're made with platinum silicone. It's food safe. Um, and tin is less, uh, less so. It is a larger molecular bond. So the example I usually like to uh, compare them to on a molecular level is pumice stone would be a tin silicone and granite would be the platinum. Just much tighter, less surface area, so stuff can't grow. Traditionally, these two, this particular bit of silicone that I'm gonna show you is a um, platinum pure silicone and it is a part A and a part B. Generally, I thought part A and part B stands for activator and base. I don't think that's the case in this scenario, but let's pretend it is. This is an equal part, one to one by weight, and then I've added 3% of pigment. So when you mix it together and it is one solid color, you pour it into the mold, close up the mold, and it will cure by tomorrow. I would consider myself a bit of a scientist as well as an artist because never in my life did I expect to be working with such chemicals that react different ways to different things that you oftentimes only learn through trial and error. Industrial design is also a part of the stop motion process. 3D printing aids in the creation of armatures. Hi, my name is Winona Huang and I am a puppet fabricator at Shadow Machine. My formal training is in jewelry and small scale sculpture in metalsmithing. 3D modeling and like 3D printing is just one aspect of digital fabrication that we use in, in like in tandem with crafting puppets. Um, and this is definitely technology that has been utilized in more modern, you know, days. I think in the past, we definitely didn't have these tools so readily available to use. Um, 3D modeling in the ILM style, the Industrial Light and Magic style, is very specific to the way that characters look and feel. And the way that we utilize it is so that we can make physical items, you know, like this, so that we can make eyeballs like this, right? So in order to get to this point, you have to start with a 3D design and a 3D model. The things that we're taking into account for an eyeball like this are sort of the final size that it needs to be, and then sort of working backwards to get the initial model that we need. Um, but I think there's a lot, there's a lot to um, digital fabrication that kind of, yeah, works with the final process of making something. Um, for example, in the eyes, we also have these sockets that kind of hold the eye together, and that's these pieces. So there's a lot of s sort of small engineering feats that we have to do, and a lot of re research and development, a lot of testing, in order to get things to work properly and work together in order to make a puppet a better version of a functional puppet.
you know, or the best version of a functional puppet that we can make. Material science and engineering are both used to clothe the puppets and make their clothes behave like that of a real full-size person. Uh, my name is Elsa Dye, and I'm a costume fabricator at Shadow Machine. So this is just a layout of a, a, one of our basic costumes. There's a certain amount of engineering that goes into it. I'm actually buying fabrics off the rack. We have to uh, scale things down when we're working at a small scale. Like our puppet, our main puppets are usually about this tall. So we have to find a fabric that reads correctly at that size so we can actually kind of trick the eye into thinking this is a, a real life-size human that's walking around. So I took this, um, we dyed it, so with almost any fabric we will at least do that step to alter it. And then in order to scale this down further, because you can see this stripe is a little bit on the large side, um, we took these various color threads and stitched into it on the sewing machine. And so it just takes that stripe scale down to something that's like readable as a miniature pajama fabric. Clothing construction for stop motion is we will generally line all of our fabrics. And this is this gives us some control because um, the animator's having to constantly grab the puppet. And in doing that, if he's moving the fabric, or he or she is moving the fabric around a lot, that is going to call, cause what we call crawl because it's taken one frame at a time. Um, so this helps support it and so it'll spring back into the same place and it'll make it less obvious that you know his, his shirt isn't moving independently. When you line a fabric, it stiffens it and it also, like if you fold that fabric, you have like really large scale wrinkles when you're talking about the size that we're working at. So this is where a little bit of engineering comes in. <laughs> so we're going to, we go back and actually cut away pieces of that lining so that these fabrics will then fold at scale in those areas. So you can see this is um, the inside of a sleeve at the elbow where I've cut all these little creases so it'll fold and it'll look like it's folding correctly at the scale. Well, like having a textile background I think is very key. Um, it, it, it helps to know um, textiles sort of all through the process like I do. Like, um, I, I, know thing, I know about fibers and different types of fibers and how they work. Um, like, I'm, I'm actually a hand spinner, so I, like, I'm used to like working with things just on the fiber level. And then when you get into um, different fiber types, they will perform differently. They'll take dye differently. Um, and you can say with something like silk, which is a very extremely th fine but um, thin fiber, you can make a very fine fabric, which is really useful. And that's actually what our lining is here. This is a, a stretch silk lining. I'd like to take time to thank Shadow Machine for graciously hosting us. I was very much inspired by everyone I spoke with today. This video was brought to you by Comcast. Thank you to our partners over there. Um, thank you to everybody who spoke with us today. And hopefully everybody watching is now interested in stop motion animation. So thank you.